All right, well, today we're continuing our Bible year and the Jesus stories. We're working our way through the Gospels here in September and October. And last week we got introduced to the Gospel of Luke and uh, focused on the, what's unique about Luke. And it makes it different than Matthew and Mark and John. And in Luke, we learned last week more than any other Gospel that we see God's inclusive love. I mean, this is what Luke focuses on more than the other Gospels. They all include that, but, but Luke includes story after story that, that are unique to Luke's Gospel, that show the wideness of God's mercy. As, as I noted last week, as a, uh, one of the commentators said, God's love is wider than ours, God's vision is larger than ours, and God's table is bigger than ours. And that's good news because otherwise none of us would be here today. Well, today we discover even more about the character of God because we learn in the Gospel of Luke, not only does God, uh, and we see this in the way Jesus uh, lived his ministry, not only does God uh, welcome everybody into his family, but God actually seeks those who are lost. It's not just a passive waking, waiting for people to show up and letting them come in. It's actually going out and seeking them. In Luke 15, is where we're going to be focusing, and it's the assigned reading for today if you're following the daily readings. And this, this chapter is one of the most beautifully crafted chapters in all of the Bible. It's just amazing. And, and in this chapter, in chapter 15 of Luke, God, uh, Jesus is telling three parables that paint a very vivid picture of the heart of God. We see in these three parables God's gracious and merciful heart. As one author puts it, Luke 15 gives us a precious gift. Three parables of the lost ones. But then he goes on to say, you know, even before you get to those parables, you have to kind of ask a, a few uh, important questions to keep in mind as you're understanding what these parables, because you're telling a story and what's the point of the story, what was Jesus trying to teach us by it. Uh, and he says, first, as you're reading these things in context, pay attention to who's actually hearing the parable that Jesus is saying, who's listening to it. And, and, and the person who's hearing this parable, the people hearing these parables, what questions or convictions are they having? What, where are they standing as they're hearing this? And how might they have received it? And the second thing to ask about parables is, is in this parable, is Jesus describing how we should be relating to one another and how we should be conducting our own life? Or is in this parable telling us something about God and how God acts towards us? And of course, the best parables manage to do both, as we're going to see today. So as we begin chapter 15 in Luke, we see two distinct groups who are drawing near to Jesus. They have opposite opinions. They have opposite intentions. In Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 2, uh, we read this. All the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around Jesus to listen to him. The Pharisees and the legal experts were grumbling, saying, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so there we have our audience. We have our two groups. We have the tax collectors and the sinners who are gathering around Jesus to listen to him. And on the other hand, we have the Pharisees and the legal experts, sometimes uh, translated the scribes. And the sinners, for their part, were coming to Jesus on their own initiative. It seems that wherever Jesus went, this is the kind of crowd that, that were drawn to him, who gathered around him. There was something about Jesus that, that brought them close. Now, we have to remember that if Jesus was keeping to the letter of the Torah, he would have shunned all of these people. They don't have any business being around a man of God. In fact, Jesus, even in associating with tax collectors, with prostitutes, with all of these other sinners, he would have been considered unclean just by association. But we're told that they were drawing near to him because they wanted to listen to him. And I think that, and sometimes we can kind of go over that, why they were actually drawing near, but that's such a beautiful sentiment. It's one of those, just those little, little glimpses of, of, of insight that makes us ask perhaps, you know, why have we drawn close to Jesus or when did we last draw close to Jesus? These outcasts had their hearts, their minds open so they could understand, so they could receive what Jesus is saying and what Jesus is doing. But many of us come to church, and I've done this too, and I observe my faith because it's habit. It's just what I do on a Sunday, or it's what I do with a morning devotion. But when was the last time that we truly kindled the desire in our hearts to draw close to Jesus? Not just to do it because we've always done it, but because we want to listen and we want to draw near. But that certainly was not why the Pharisees and the legal experts were, were there. They seemed to follow Jesus around only to challenge him. They were interested in finding fault with Jesus 
because Jesus was a threat to them. We talked about this in Matthew and some in Mark and here in Luke again. That, that these Pharisees who kept to the letter of the law, they lived such clean lives, but he challenged their traditions by the way he lived. Jesus challenged their authority, the way he taught, the way he acted. He undermined their standing in front of the people. They wanted, therefore, to challenge him and to trap him and to bring him down. And we see that escalating throughout all of the Gospels. Because their complice, com- precise compliance with the law of Moses, it made them clean. And that's a good thing to be obedient but it also convinced them that they were justified and righteous before God because of what they had done. They had upheld these highest standards, and so they assumed they deserved the divine reward, but they also assumed it was impossible that all of these others who were following Jesus around deserved to be there too. They decidedly did not deserve divine favor. And yet here's Jesus. Everybody's raving about him. Everybody's talking about him in awe and wonder at the things that he's doing, the signs, the miracles, the authority of his teaching, a true man of God who's, who's, who's speaking with sinners, but not just speaking with them, they're eating with him. And so we're told they grumble. They grumble about Jesus. They grumble about what Jesus, who's associating with and who he's eating with. And, and I hadn't really paid attention to this, but there's actually a lot of grumbling in the Gospels, particularly in the Gospel of Luke. The crowds grumble in chapter 19 when Jesus goes home to the tax collector Zacchaeus. Why would he do something as, as despicable as that? They grumble about Jesus over and over. Sometimes they're incredulous about what Jesus is doing, and sometimes they're absolutely scandalized. And ironically, when we hear the grumbling and the incredulity and the scandalization of of what Jesus is doing in his ministry and his life, it's almost always when Jesus is demonstrating God's love and God's mercy and God's forgiveness and God's healing. That tells you something. Of all the things that could get you upset, why those? Why do those things seem to upset the religious leaders? It's called the scandal of grace. And Jesus creates quite the scandal when he sits down at the table to eat with these sinners. In the ancient Near Eastern culture in which he lived, and it's true in many cultures today, to eat with somebody, to share a table with somebody, is to say we're equal. It's, a, it's an act of unity. It's an act of acceptance. It's an act of friendship. And so when Jesus eats with these people, whom their scriptures clearly have condemned, he's saying to them, you belong to us now. Jesus is teaching us this new law of love. And that could be hard to accept. It's hard to accept if you know you're not deserving of it, if you know you haven't earned it, if you're not worthy to be there. It's hard to accept grace. A lot of people struggle with that. They think they have to get their life together. They think they have to have it be on the straight and narrow and have everything in their life in order in order to receive God's love. But it's actually the opposite. We struggle with that, but we struggle on the other end too, because when we see that love and grace extended to somebody that we look down upon and that we judge, we don't like it anymore. And it can cause us to grumble. And Jesus gets that. He knows why the Pharisees are grumbling. He knows why we grumble sometimes. And so he tells three parables in this chapter to help us understand the heart of God. Jesus told them this parable, and this is in three through seven of that chapter. Suppose somebody among you had a hundred sheep and lost one of them. Wouldn't he leave the other 99 in a pasture and search for the one, uh, the lost one, until he finds it? And when he finds it, he's thrilled and places it on his shoulders. And when he arrives home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, celebrate with me, because I've found my lost sheep. In the same way, he goes on to say, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who changes both heart and life It's often translated, who repents, over 99 righteous people who have no need to change their hearts and their lives. I think it's interesting that the way Jesus tells this parable, it seems like he's making an obvious statement that, of course, a shepherd would leave 99 sheep in the pasture to go seek the lost one. But truthfully, he was actually telling quite a ridiculous story, and everybody would have known it. Because a shepherd doesn't own the sheep, the shepherd is a caretaker for the sheep, and there's no sensible, practical, smart shepherd who's going to jeopardize or endanger their owner's investment, risking 99% just to save 1%. Why would you risk 99 to save 1? 
It's just not common sense. Losing one or two along the way is just the cost of doing shepherding business. It's already factored into what they were expecting. And yet not only does the shepherd go and find the lost sheep, but, but then he carries it home in his arms and he throws a party to celebrate. And that celebration probably costs more than the lost sheep did to begin with. But that's part of why the parable makes this point so effectively. Because none of us would take that risk. None of us would absorb all that extra cost. None of us would even bother showing up to a cel- um, You want me to come celebrate a lost sheep? Yeah, I got other things I need to be doing. But of course, neither would the Pharisees risk reaching out to these sinners or taking that risk either. But God does when it comes to those who are lost. That's Jesus' point. He doesn't cut them loose. He doesn't just let them go. He pursues them with this extravagant and irrational and reckless love. That's what this parable is pointing us to, until they are found. And, and the second parable he tells is exactly like it. He continues on in 8 through 10. Or what woman, if she owns 10 silver coins and loses one of them, won't light a lamp and sweep the house, searching her home carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Celebrate with me, because I found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you, joy breaks out in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who changes both heart and heart. And life. I have a rule of thumb in my life that if I pay myself minimum wage and it costs me more to find something that it actually is worth on an hourly basis, I just let it go. <laughs> but not so with this woman. You know, as you're hearing these parables and you're imagining the Pharisees and legal experts hearing them, you know that they're well educated. You know that his point is not lost on them. Jesus isn't being subtle here. They knew he was illustrating this great chasm, this gap between the Pharisees grumbling about the company that Jesus kept and why he kept that company and God's extravagant love for everyone. But Jesus' parables would not have been lost on those sinners and outcasts either. There's a reason why they keep drawing near to listen to him. Because Jesus says the kingdom of God has come near and in this kingdom, Jesus is telling me I have a place. And so this is where I want to be. And then we have the grand finale of this chapter, the parable of the prodigal son. We know this parable well. It's one of the most beautiful parables in all of Scripture. Jesus said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the inheritance. And then the father divided his estate between them. And soon after, that younger son gathered everything together. He took a trip to a faraway land, and there he wasted his wealth through extravagant living. And when he had used up all of his resources, there was a severe food shortage in that particular country, and he began to be in need. And so he hired himself out to the citizens of that country who put him to work feeding the pigs in the field. This is like the lowest job you can have if you're Jewish. No one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food, but I'm starving to death, and so I'm going to get up and go to my father. And I'm going to say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Take me on as one of your hired hands. And so he got up and went to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with compassion. His father ran to him, hugged him, and kissed him. And then his son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But the father said to his servants quickly, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Fetch the fattened calf and slaughter it. We must celebrate with feasting. Because this son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate this parable. It's one of the most beautiful stories ever told, illustrating God's grace and God's mercy, God's love and receiving one who was lost. It's seen through this father's embrace of his wayward son. This father who's not following the rules of cause and effect, who's not trying to teach a lesson of of every action has its consequences. He doesn't make his son earn back his love and prove himself. He doesn't make his son work off his debt before he can come back and sit at the table. He just hugs him. He just embraces him. And then he throws a huge party. And Jesus says, so it is with anyone who turns their hearts back to God. But of course, that's not the end of the story, is it? As we continue and finish reading the parable, we realize that all along there wasn't just one lost son, there was actually two lost sons. Because then we read now the older son, the older brother, he was in the field. 
And coming in from the field, he approached the house and heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what was going on. And the servant replied, your brother has arrived, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he's received his son back safe and sound. And the older son was just furious. And he didn't want to enter in. He didn't want to join this party. His father came out. Just like he went out to his younger son, he comes out to his older son now and begs him. And he answered his father, look, I've served you all these years, never disobeyed your instruction, yet you've never given me as much as a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours returned, after gobbling up your estate on prostitutes, you slaughter the fattened calf for him. And then his father said, son, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Now, we're not told in this parable how that older son responds. We don't know if he had a change of heart and went into the party and shared in the joy of the celebration that was happening or if that older brother continued to have a hard heart and decided that he would rather stew in his resentment and stew in his sense of entitlement and stew in his self righteousness. We don't know. But that same question, this parable asked that of the Pharisees, how are you going to respond to what Jesus is doing here? And I think that same question can be asked of us. Some people relate more to the younger brother and his life journey and have sort of found your own way into all kinds of trouble and are wondering if you can find your way back. And there's plenty of us who relate more to that older brother. But part of what this parable teaches us is that no matter who you relate more to, everyone has their own sense of being lost. Lost one way or the other. God loves us, and he invites us to the feast. That father invited the younger son through the feast in his honor, invited the older son to the feast too. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter which direction you're coming to this feast from. The invitation is to all of us, and there's no way that we can sin our way out of that invitation. There's no way we can do anything that turns God away from seeking us. But neither can we earn our way in or presume that we've made it on our own because of how we've lived our life, our goodness, and our own merit. The parable tells us all of this is grace. All of it is grace. Everybody is at that table because of grace. And it's just whether or not we're willing to accept it from where we are now. One commentator put it like this, God is where lostness reigns. God is in the darkness of the wilderness. God is in the remotest corners of the house. God is where the search is at its fiercest. God is that shepherd who risks it all, who searches, who endures, who resists any temptation to stop seeking until that last lamb is found. And when found, there's rejoicing, there's celebration, indeed there is a party. So in the end, the heart of God is about searching and it's about finding, it's about rejoicing. And from our part, it's not about being criticized or chastised or condemned. It's all about being found. Imperfect, broken, lost people being loved and cherished and welcomed home. And as those who want to draw near to Jesus, we have to know that where Jesus is, is out seeking the lost. And if we want to be near to him, we should join that search.